Well, it's good to be back in the book of Hebrews this morning. So if you do have your copy of God's Word, if you'll turn with me to the book of Hebrews. And our focus this morning will be Hebrews chapter 7. But in order to get us back into the context of the book, I would like us to start in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Um, If you're using a pew Bible this morning, it's page 694. We'll be reading chapter 4, verses 14 through chapter 5, verse 10, and then we'll jump over to Hebrews chapter 7. And if you've found your spot in God's Word, if you will stand with me as we honor its reading. As we begin in... Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, which begins an extended argument for the superiority of Christ's priesthood. And so as we begin in verse 14 of chapter 4, we'll see how this argument unfolds. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, the apostle writes, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now join me in chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, 
but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Father, please help us as we look into your word this morning. Help me to be clear. And God, I pray that your spirit will teach us. Give us insight into this text. And Lord, let us see Jesus more clearly. Let us see him in his great high priesthood. And Father, I pray for those who are here who have never trusted in Christ, that even today they might see the beauty of Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. The greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. So said Michelangelo. Michelangelo, the Renaissance artist, not the Ninja Turtle. Our danger, he says, is not usually that we set our goals too high. It's that we set our goals too low. We reach those low goals, and then we're satisfied. Given that this is so often true, and I think that you can even testify in your own lives how true it is, let me ask you to consider this. What is the goal of your Christian faith? What is the goal of your Christian faith? It shouldn't be health, wealth, and an easy life because the Bible nowhere promises that on this earth. It's not even peace and inner happiness, though those are good things. It's not even heaven when you die. Though, of course, I hope that you all attain to heaven. Now, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of your Christian faith is to get to God. That's the ultimate goal. Your goal should be to get to to God. And that's really the entire biblical story summarized. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve lived in a sinless and blessed state with free access to God. They walked with God in the cool of the day. But you continue reading and by the end of Genesis 3, they're exiled from the garden and they're barred from re-entering. Their sin had caused a separation, an alienation from God. No longer is humanity in the garden, in that that blessed state of, of the presence of God. Now we are separated because of our sin. But to the nation of Israel, God graciously gave a way for his people to draw near to him again. Through the temple and the priest and the animal sacrifices. And yet, even in that 
that grace, there was still a separation. There, there still was something that was between God and the people. And it was a visible separation as God's presence was in the temple in the Holy of Holies. And then there was a curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. And only the high priest could enter into the presence of God one time a year. And even then, only the high priest could enter one time a year with the blood of sacrifice. For the rest of the people, they had to remain outside the walls of the temple. There still was separation. And yet still by these things, through the temple, the priests, the animal sacrifices, the children of Israel could draw near to God. Which, as we come back to the original question I posed, is the ultimate goal of our faith. That's the biblical storyline. How do we get back to God? That was the purpose of the priests. As we read in chapter 5, Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. How do we get back to God? Well, in the nation of Israel under the old covenant, it was through the priests who brought animal sacrifices and he stood in between God and the people. And this really speaks to our greatest need. Because sin has separated us from God. But not only are we separated from God, we are at war with him. We're rebels. And as such, we are under his judgment and wrath. And we can see through, through the, the setup that God gave to the nation of Israel that, that no amount of good works can ever atone and bring us back to God. If the Israelites just need to be good people, then why the temple, the priests, the sacrifices? This is a very clear example of, of what it takes for us to get back to God. Only the priesthood. And only the priesthood appointed by God, making an acceptable sacrifice, can bring you back to God. That's the purpose of the priest. It's to, it's to accomplish that ultimate goal of your faith, to bring you back to God, which brings us to our text this morning. So we continue our study of the book of Hebrews. And since it's been several months since we've been in the book of Hebrews, let me remind you where we are. Because even as we read through this, there are probably some of you scratching your head. I know that we went through this, but I have no idea what this means. Let me help you. The book of Hebrews can easily be summarized by the phrase, Jesus is better. If someone were to come up to you and say, what is the book of Hebrews about? Just say, Jesus is better. That, that's, that is what the book is about. The, the author is writing to primarily Jewish Christians who are making the transition away from the old covenant and the system of worship that's centered on the temple in Jerusalem that is officiated by the, the priest, the Levitical priest, and, and the animal sacrifices. They're transitioning from that system of worship to the new covenant that's based entirely upon the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are still questions. That they're, still, they're still trying to, to figure out exactly all the implications of this. And because of persecution... Persecution first from the, the Jewish religious leaders and then from the, the Roman officials. Because of this persecution, some are being tempted to return to the Old Covenant. They're being tempted to, to leave the church and go back to the temple and the priest and the animal sacrifices. And so the apostle who wrote the book of Hebrews, he argues that Jesus is better. 
He starts in chapter 1 by saying that Jesus is the final and better revelation from God. The prophets in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they had revelation from God, but Jesus now is the final revelation. He is the full revelation, the better revelation. He is better than the angels because he is the second person in the Trinity. He is God the Son. He is better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. And now we're here in the heart of the book. This is the largest section of the book. It begins in chapter 4, verse 14. It goes to the end of chapter 10. So that block is one big section that, that forms the heart of the book. And the main emphasis of that big section is Jesus is the better high priest who mediates a better covenant because he offers a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better high priest who mediates a better covenant because he offers a better sacrifice. And so he begins by comparing Jesus to the high priest in Jerusalem in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Here's the comparison between the high priest that, that you know in Jerusalem and Jesus. He's better. But then he stops and he adds a parenthesis that runs from chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 20. Jesus, he writes, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he wants to tell them more about this, but he, he can't because he says they become lazy and dull of hearing and they won't understand. And so he warns them, press on to maturity. Don't become lazy. Because that, that's the road to apostasy. You're going to leave unless you understand this, unless you get it. So press on. And then in the very last verse of chapter 6, he returns to his previous statement that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. If you've never heard of Melchizedek before, you're probably saying, I don't know what's going on. So we come to chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, and we get a, a summary of this story from Genesis chapter 14 about this king priest, this man who was the king of Salem. This was ancient Jerusalem. He's a king, but he also serves as a priest, and he, he meets Abraham in Genesis 14. And in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, the writer argues that Melchizedek is greater than the, the priest that come from the line of Aaron. And he, he argues this because he's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He, he doesn't his priesthood isn't based on genealogy, and he receives tithes or, or money from Abraham, and he in return blesses Abraham. And all of these things clump together, say Melchizedek is better than the Levites. And the author argues that here in Genesis 14, thousands of years before this book is written, he says the Bible already was anticipating a greater priest than the Levites. The Bible is anticipating someone who's going to look like Melchizedek, but he's going to be infinitely better than Melchizedek. He's going to be the true king of righteousness. He's going to be the true king of peace. He his genealogy is not the basis for his priesthood. He, he receives the honor and the praise and the glory from the people. And he, in return, gives all blessings to the people. And yet a question remains for these new Christians. There are already priests in Jerusalem who offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. Wherever these Christians are, they know we could make the trip to Jerusalem and here is sacrifices being made by a priesthood in a temple that is for the forgiveness of sins. If, if there's already this priesthood, if these things have already been established under the law given to Moses, then why is there a need for a new and different priesthood after the order of Melchizedek? Isn't this just redundant? 
Why do we need something new when we already have something that, that's been established for a thousand years? And this takes us back to my original question again. What is the ultimate goal of your Christian faith? Michelangelo was right. Our greater danger is not in aiming too high. We aim too low and we're satisfied. The ultimate goal of Christianity is getting to God. Not, not just in this proximity, actually getting to him, actually having fellowship with him, actually having communion and a relationship with him. And the only way to reach the goal is not through the Levites, it's through the priesthood of Jesus. That's the only way you can, you can actually get to God. It's through the priesthood of Jesus. And so today in this passage, I want to show you that this is the case. So that you, my Christian brothers and sisters, will love and cling to Jesus more. That you'll see that in him and in him alone, you have access to God. You have access to God himself. And if you're here and you never before trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I, I pray that through this passage you'll turn to him as you see that in him is the only way you can ever draw near to God. So, if there is already a priesthood established, why is there a need for another one? Why is there a need for a new one after the order of Melchizedek? We're going to divide this passage into two points. Two points, answering that question. If there's already a priesthood, why do we need a new one? The first one is that perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. So there's the weakness of the Levites. Perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. And the second point is that only Jesus' priesthood truly brings us to God. So look back at our text. Perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. That's what he says in verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek and not one named after the order of Aaron? If perfection was attainable, why something new? And the, the question is really a hypothetical. It's, 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 the answer is it wasn't. It wasn't attainable. Perfection was not attainable. Now, please remember that the priests were the central figures in Israel's worship. He emphasizes that with what's in the parentheses in verse 11. Under the Levitical priesthood, the people received the law. That This is the, the, the ceremonial law of the temple and the sacrifices and the rituals. They all were, were bound together by the priesthood. You couldn't have one without the other. So without the priest, there is no temple worship. There would be no ceremonies. There would be no sacrifices. There would be no atonement. This is a vital point that we can't miss. And it's easy for us to, to kind of overlook this, to gloss over this, because we've, we've been separated from this type of worship for 2,000 plus years. If, if George and Jay and Dave and Parker and Philip one day just all disappeared, don't know where you've gone, we're gone, you'd find new pastors. <laughs> you'd find new pastors. The, the church and your worship, it might be disrupted, but you could keep going. You could keep practicing Christianity. You could keep... Keep going in your worship. Not true for temple worship. Not true for temple worship. The priests were indispensable for temple worship. George is certainly not indispensable for Christ Fellowship Church worship. You guys will go on when I'm not here anymore. Not so for temple worship. And again, this, this strikes at the heart of our need for our sins to be forgiven. Without the priest, how can I know that my sins are forgiven? If, if, 
If I leave the temple and the priest and the sacrifices, how do I know I'm going to be okay? Modern Judaism has a problem with this because they haven't had a temple or priest or animal sacrifices in 2,000 years. You can't dismiss the priest unless you dismiss the law. That's what he says in verse 12. When there is a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law. You, you can't have one without the other. They are intricately related together. And so for these early Jewish Christians, the, the temptation would be to assume the, the superiority and the absolute necessity of the, the Levitical priesthood in Jerusalem and to leave Christ and the church, and go back to the animal sacrifices. That's their, that is their big temptation because they know that their need is for atonement. There has to be a sacrifice, and we know what's going on in Jerusalem. If I leave there and I, and I cling to Jesus and I stay in the church, what's going to happen to me? And so this question, this, this whole passage, it, it may be kind of on the periphery for you guys, but this would have been absolutely at the heart of, of the problem for these new Jewish Christians. But he says that the scriptures, they, they anticipate another priesthood. They anticipate another priesthood, and, and one not from the tribe of Levi, but, but from the order of Melchizedek. And two proofs are given that this is true, that, that both the Levitical priesthood as well as the ceremonial laws that, that are surrounding the temple worship have been changed. That's his whole point. In his questions in verses 11 and 12, he's trying to get them to see there has been a change. There has been a change. And so he gives two proofs. The first proof is found in verses 13 and 14. That Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. So I think we need to, we need to remember, he's, he's not writing to convince these people that Jesus is the Messiah. He's writing to Christians, or at least professing Christians. These are people that have already heard the gospel, and they, they have already said, Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. His, he has died and he has been raised from the dead. He's not, he's not trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. He's trying to prove to them that Jesus is a superior priest. He's trying to get them to make a clean break away from what's going on in Jerusalem and cling to Jesus alone. And so he says, first proof is that Jesus isn't a Levite. He's not a Levite. He's from Judah. The law prescribed that only Aaron and his sons, all from the tribe of Levi, all going back to, to uh, there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. One of those sons is Levi. And from Levi comes Aaron and his sons who are the priest. And the law prescribes that it's only them. They're the only ones that can serve as priests. Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. God tells Moses, bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people to serve me as priest. Verse 43 of Exodus 28. These, the, 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 the priestly garments and the priestly roll, they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. Exodus chapter 30, verse 30. It says, you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priest. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 7, Verses 63 through 65, after the exiles returned from Babylon, if someone couldn't prove their genealogical identity as a Levite, they were excluded from the priesthood. This is not something that there's some wiggle room. This is not something that the, the people of Israel were willing to, to just take their word on it. If you don't have a piece of paper that's got a family tree that takes you back to the Levitical priesthood, you are not a priest. But Jesus, 
he's not a Levite. Look at what it says. Verse 13, for the one of whom these things are spoken, the one who, who he is claiming is after the order of Melchizedek, the one who is greater, the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. In fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, one of the kings from Judah tried to serve at the altar. And if you know the story, when he tried to do it, God struck him with leprosy. Because it's not for the kings to serve at the altar in Jerusalem. Verse 14, it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Again, no wiggle room. Jesus was not a Levite. Jesus, it's common knowledge now, is from Judah. Not a priestly tribe, but a kingly tribe. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 tells us, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So from the line of Judah was the anticipated king. An interesting word is used in verse 14 in the ESV. The ESV translates it as descended from Judah. But the word actually means arisen or sprung up. It's the same word that's used in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, where Balaam says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out or arise or spring up from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Again, he is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is from the line of Judah, but he is a king priest. He's the king priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is what Melchizedek was in Genesis 14, and it is what Jesus is also. And so we know that the law has been changed because the priesthood has been changed, and the, the proof that the priesthood has been changed is that Jesus is from the line of Judah. And so the law has been changed also. The ceremonies and the temple sacrifices and all the rituals, they're also out because the Levites are out. And the proof that the Levites are out is that a new priest has arisen after the order of Melchizedek from the line of Judah. And this brings us to our second proof for a new order of priest, which is Psalm 110, which is all over the book of Hebrews. Some commentators have actually said that the book of Hebrews is an exposition of Psalm 110 because the author loves it. He, he comes back to it time and time and time and time again. And what he says is that Psalm 110 anticipates this change in the priesthood. This is not something new. This is not something that the, the early disciples were making up. They are looking at Psalm 110 and they're saying, look, David is even saying there's going to be a new priest. And he's not going to be a Levite. He's going to be after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 15. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Levitical priests were established under the law. Moses goes to Mount Sinai, he receives the law, he gives it to the people, it establishes a Levitical priesthood, a priesthood that's based upon genealogy. You have to be a Levite. But David who's writing 400 years after the law was given, says, be on the lookout for a king priest after the order of Melchizedek. And if there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law. 
They're looking forward to something greater. The, the, the Levitical priesthood was established by the law. It was good. Under the law, God gave this to the nation of Israel so that they might have access to him through animal sacrifices, but it was always temporary. It was always temporary. There was always the anticipation that something greater is coming. But we still haven't really answered the question, why a new order of priest if there is already a priesthood? It's because, going back to verse 11, perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. If it was, why would there have to be a new one? The answer is, it wasn't. Perfection was not attainable. Now, what does he mean by perfection? What does he mean by perfection? The Greek word teleos, it, it means completeness or, or fulfillment or the goal. Look at verses 18 and 19. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. The, a former commandment. This is the, that priest must come from the order of, of Levi. It's set aside because the law made nothing perfect. But he goes on to say, on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. There's a parallel that's being, that's being set forth for us. The former commandment has been set aside for a better hope. You see the parallel? Former commandment, better hope. The law made nothing perfect. What's the parallel? Better hope that brings us near to God, right? It draw, we draw near to God. So perfection equals drawing near to God. Perfection or the goal or what it was all about is for people to draw near to God. Perfection, as one commentator says, is unimpeded access to God an unbroken communion with him. That's the ultimate goal. It's the ultimate goal, and it's not attainable through the Levitical priest any more than it's attainable through the sacrifices that they offered, which is what he says in chapter 10. The law is but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The Levitical priesthood can't bring that unimpeded, unbroken access to God, and neither can the animal sacrifices that they offer. Why not? Why not? Why is this goal of, of unimpeded, unbroken communion and fellowship and access to God, why is it not attainable through the Levites? First, we see in verse 16 that it's because it's fleshly. It's fleshly. That's what he says. He says that, uh, verse 16, the Levites are on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent. That legal, the, the legal requirement concerning bodily descent, it literally reads uh, a fleshly commandment. It's a fleshly commandment. In, in other words, it's based on genealogy. It's based on genealogy. It, it's, it's outward. So, so a man didn't necessarily have to be morally fit or even want the job. If you're descended from Aaron, you don't go to a guidance counselor to say, what, what, am, I, what am I good at? What, what job should I have? Well, it says here that you're descended from Aaron. You're a Levite. I think that we can just fill in priest. Even if you don't want it, even if you're not morally fit, if you're descended from Aaron, if you're a Levite, you are a priest. And so you could have a righteous priest. Or you could have priests like Hophni and Phinehas, who in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, are called sons of the devil. And this fleshly commandment, 
that's based entirely on a genealogical principle cannot bring you to God. But second, we see if we jump over to verse 23 that the Levitical priesthood, they can't bring perfection. It's not attainable through them because it's temporary. And it's temporary because they're mortal. Verse 23, the former priests were many in number. There's a lot of them. Why? Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. You could have a bad priest like Hophni and Phineas, and, and when they die, you don't shed any tears. But on the other hand, you could have a wonderful priest. And no matter how much you love him, he's still going to die. Perfection is not attainable because the priesthood is constantly in flux. The Jewish historian Josephus, he counted that there were 83 high priests from Aaron to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's 70 high priests. You could have good ones, you could have bad ones, and that's not even counting all the other priests that would be, that would be working and ministering and offering sacrifices in the temple. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of priests, and they can't bring you unbroken access to God because just when you get a good high priest, he gets sick and dies. The third reason why perfection is not attainable through the Levites is that it's superintended by sinners. Verse 27. We've got a comparison between Jesus and these other high priests. These other high priests... They have to offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins, and then for those of the people. We see this back in chapter 5, verse 3. These high priests, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And we can look at Exodus chapter 29. We can look at Leviticus 4 and 9 and, and Numbers 28 and, and day after day, after day, morning and evening, they are offering sacrifices over and over and over again for, for sin. And it all centers, it all comes to a culmination on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, where the high priest has to offer sacrifice first for his own sin. He goes into the most holy place with blood from a sacrifice for his own sins. And then after his sins have been atoned for, then he can go out and atone for the sins of the people. Because if he doesn't atone for his own sins first, he's going to die. Perfection drawing us near to, to God. It's not attainable through the Le Levitical priesthood because they're sinners too. Who's going to bring them to God? They have to offer sacrifices for their own sins. They have to be looking forward in anticipation to something that's going to actually deal with their sin too. For these reasons, the author can say in verse 18 that the Levitical priesthood was ultimately weak and useless. It couldn't accomplish the goal of bringing people to unimpeded and unbroken communion with God. And all we have to do is look at how the nation of Israel turned out in the Old Testament to say that's true. Because the nation deteriorated. The nation, it degenerated into idolatry and, and perversion and, and they were sacrificing their children. It sounds like America. And if you read the prophets, where does he lay the blame? The priest. It's the priest. where one of the prophets can say, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Who's, who's supposed to give them that knowledge? The priest. They're supposed to be teaching the law, and the priests aren't. And so they can't bring unimpeded, unbroken access and communion to God. 
They're weak and they're useless. It's based on a genealogical principle. It's, it's operated by mortals who are sinners. If the priesthood given to Israel under the law couldn't accomplish the goal, and you can look back at Exodus and Leviticus and you can see the you can see how big this is, how all the laws are centered around this and every little detail, it, it's, it's prescribed in minutia in the Mosaic law. It, it shows how serious the sin issue is and how, how the only hope for a sinful people to draw close to God is through a priesthood. And he's saying, it doesn't work. The Levitical priesthood doesn't work if the priesthood given to Israel under the law couldn't accomplish the goal of bringing you to God what paltry useless weak thing are you hoping in to bring you to God if, if the, the the very thing that God prescribed in the law coming from the top of Mount Sinai can't bring you to God what do you think is going to bring you to God your good works, your, your religious ceremonies. Are you trusting in genealogy too? My dad's a pastor. My family built this church. Outward, fleshly commandments and rituals will not bring perfection. Only a better priesthood, one after the order of Melchizedek, can do that. So why was there a need for another priesthood? Because perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. But the good news, the good news that we find in this passage is that Jesus' priesthood and only Jesus' priesthood truly brings us to God. He truly brings us to God. Verse 19 tells us, it's in parentheses, so you can see it very clearly. The law made nothing perfect. The law, this, the ceremonial law of, of the priesthood and the temple and the rituals and the sacrifices, they made nothing perfect. But, but, a better hope is introduced. A better priesthood through which we draw near to God, the Lord Jesus and his great high priesthood. This is not a tack on. This is not an add on to what's already been going on. Because he says in verse 18, on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside, or the King James says, there is a disannulling. There's an abrogation. There, there is a throwing off of these old fleshly commandments that are based on, on bodily descent. And there is not only a replacement, there's an upgrade. It's not just more of the same, it's better. Infinitely better. But if the Levitical priesthood couldn't accomplish this, then how can Christ priesthood do it? If, if we can look at Jerusalem and the temple and, the, and the, the priest and the sacrifices and all the rituals and ceremonies and we can say, that's not going to do it, then how can we be so sure that Jesus can? And I think we can see five ways as we walk through the rest of the text. Five ways that Jesus' priesthood is superior. The first is that Jesus' priesthood isn't based on genealogy. It's not based on genealogy. Verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. I don't know, which one do you think is better? My daddy was a priest or he's been raised from the dead and he can never die again. G 
Jesus' priesthood is not like the Levitical priesthood. That's only Levites, and the only requirement is family. And so they died. Jesus' priesthood is based on the fact that he has died and he has risen from the dead. Verse 24 says he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. He continues forever. That that phrase continues forever. It, It can literally be translated as he continues unto the ages. Eons and eons and eons will pass and Jesus will remain a high priest for his people forever. He has an indestructible life. No more death. No more passing the torch. There's no retirement for this high priest. He remains unchangeably high priest for his people forever. And as such, he actually can bring you to God. It's based on an indestructible life, but to go along with that, we see in verses 20 and 21 that Jesus' priesthood is secured with an oath. It's not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. There was no oath that was accompanying the installation of Aaron and his sons. As as new priests came, they didn't have a a ceremony of of oath. They uh, They didn't have some kind of promise to go along with it. They had a command. They had a law. But this new priesthood, it's accompanied with an oath and we look again at Psalm 110, verse 4. That's, that's in verse 21. He's quoting from Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn. He's sworn an oath. What's his oath? You are a priest forever. But look at how those phrases pile up. The Lord has sworn. The next line. And he will not change his mind. The next line. You are a priest forever. If you remember months ago, so you probably don't, and that's all right. Hebrews chapter 6, the end of Hebrews chapter 6. We, we are given this, this explanation of why the oath is so powerful. Chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, says, when God made a promise to Abraham, Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. He swears an oath, and he swears it upon himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. He swears an oath to Abraham. I swear I will greatly multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God, not out of some requirement, but out of his own free grace to weak, doubting sinners, does not simply say that Jesus is going to be a priest forever. He swears it. And who does he swear it by? There's no one greater that he can hold up his hand and say, by this person, I swear. There's nothing greater than God. And so he swears by himself. I swear by myself. 
and God cannot lie, and God cannot change his mind, Jesus will permanently be high priest for his people forever. And so we have hope. We have hope. It's an anchor for our soul whenever we're, we're doubting, whenever the, the storms of life, whenever we're, we're filled with despair, all we have to do is remember God has sworn and he will not change his mind. Jesus is my high priest forever. The third reason why Jesus' priesthood is superior is found in verse 26. Jesus' priesthood is one of moral perfection. And we're going to look at this more next week. It was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. And there's five descriptions here. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He's not like the Levitical priest who have to offer sacrifices daily, time and time again for their own sins. Christ is perfection. He's perfection. We see this all over the place. Chapter 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He's been tempted in every, in every way such as, as we are, in every category he's been tempted like we are, and yet he's never sinned. He's felt the full, the full brunt of temptation. We only know temptation as people who have given in. He knows temptation as the one who has never sinned. And so he's able to sympathize with us. And because of his moral perfection, because he's never sinned, he's not only able to sympathize with us, he's able to help us. When you come to a time of need, when you come to a time of temptation, he not only sympathizes with you, he helps you. He helps you. Verse 27 Jesus' priesthood is superior because he has an indestructible life, because his priesthood is secured with an oath. His priesthood is one of moral perfection. Verse 27, he offers a better sacrifice. He offers a better sacrifice. Verse 27, they offer, the Levitical priests, they offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins and then for those of the people. But he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And we're going to hit on that in, in chapters 9 and 10, and we're going to do a deep dive into what that means. But while the Levitical priests, they offer sacrifices daily, Jesus offered one sacrifice. What does that mean? It means it actually worked. It, it means it actually atoned. And the sacrifice wasn't for his own sin, it was for the people's sins. He doesn't offer his sacrifice daily. He offered himself on the cross once for all. It's an atoning sacrifice that actually atones. It is a, a sacrifice that actually satisfies God's justice and wrath. It's a better sacrifice. And verse 22 tells us the fifth reason why. Jesus' priesthood is better, is that he's a guarantor of a better covenant. The Levitical priests, they operated within the Mosaic covenant, this law that was given on Mount Sinai. But Jesus inaugurates a new and a better covenant that contains better promises. And you're just going to have to wait a few weeks till we get to chapter 8, and then we're going to talk a lot about this new covenant and everything that Jesus not only mediates, but he guarantees 
And so all of the promises of the new covenant, they're not hypotheticals. They're not maybes. They're not hope so's. Jesus is the guarantor. His life as forever priest guarantees that all of the, the promises and benefits of the covenant are yours. That's something that the Levitical priest, they couldn't do. The Levitical priest, they couldn't do that. Here's the main point. Here's the main point. If perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, there wouldn't have been another one. But the Levites, they could not bring us to God. The law, it says, it, it could make nothing perfect. But look at verse 25. Circle this, underline it, highlight it, put a star next to it, memorize it, put it on your wall, put it on, on your mirror in your bathroom, meditate upon this, because he says, consequently, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Levitical priests, they, they couldn't bring the people fully and perfectly to God. It and, and the law under which it operated was weak and useless to accomplish this goal. However, by his indestructible life and the unchangeable oath and his moral perfection and his better sacrifice that guarantees a better covenant, Christ's priesthood is perfect. It actually accomplishes the goal. He is able. It's the word for strong. It's the word that, that we, trans, we can translate into dynamite. It's strong to save to the uttermost completely, perfectly for all times those who actually draw near to God. Not through an earthly priesthood. Not through their good works. Not through their religious rituals. Not through their charitable giving. Not through their church attendance. Not by their political voting record. But through Jesus because he always lives to intercede for them. And the law, verse 28 says, it appoints men in their weakness as high priest. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. He is actually able to save. He is actually able to save. He is actually able able to bring us to God. Nothing and no one else can. And the implication is clear. To reject this Jesus or to try and substitute some lesser thing for his perfect priesthood would be madness. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Search all the religions of the world Search all the philosophies and the so-called wisdom and schemes and programs of man. Only the priesthood of the Lord Jesus can actually bring you to God. Not maybe, not I hope so, not we'll, we'll find out. He actually does it. He actually does it. And if you're a Christian today, be encouraged. You have in Jesus all you will ever need. You can't add anything to his perfections. He brings you to God. Not just inner happiness and peace. Not just heaven when you die. He brings you to God. He brings you to God. In the incarnation, God himself came for us. He tabernacled amongst us. His blood atones for us. He ever lives for us. And so let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm 1,000% sure that Michelangelo was not talking about Hebrews chapter 7. But he's still right. We too often set our aim too low. 
and then we're satisfied. The ultimate goal of our Christian faith is to get to God. And Christ has opened the way. And so, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you that despite our sin and our weaknesses and our failings, Jesus brings us to you. And we don't have to hope that we'll be a good enough person and that our, our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds. We don't have to hope that we read our Bibles enough or prayed enough or went to church enough. Our hope is in Christ alone. Father, I pray that your people will be encouraged to look to Jesus alone, that they will cling to his, his perfect priesthood and his perfect sacrifice, and that they will rest in him. And Father, I pray for those who have never trusted in Christ, those who have heard of who Jesus is, they have heard of of, of how he is the only way to get to God. And yet maybe they're still they're still refusing to come. Maybe they don't even care. Maybe they don't even see their need. Father, we know that salvation belongs to you. We ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would convict of sin, grant repentance and faith, open blind eyes and deaf ears and, and transform hard hearts to see the beauty and the glory of Christ Father, we pray that you would work through your word and be glorified. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.